We begin with uh, uh, public debt and economic growth in Italy by Balas Fabrizio Balassone, Mauro Francese, and uh, Angelo Pace. I think you are, you are presenting the paper. Okay. So I was saying I have the pleasure of uh, having the opportunity to present our work on public debt and economic work. This is a joint work with Angelo Pace and Fabrizio Balassone, which are also here with me this morning. So I don't think there is much need to, to justify our interest in this topic. This is a, an issue that has been hotly debated both in the literature and in policy analysis. And recently, it has become a prominent issue because of the surge in public debts uh, across, industrial, uh, across industrialized uh, countries. And there is a large literature. And this large literature has highlighted some potential adverse effects of uh, very high level of debt on, on economic growth. These channels go through the, uh, the effects on, on, on long-term interest rates and expectation of future taxation to repay uh, debt. They refer to increased macroeconomic uncertainty and a third category refers to the reduced margin for counter-cyclical uh, fiscal policy that the government has when it is bounded by a, a very high uh, very high public debt. As I was saying, there has been uh, recently uh, an increased interest on these topics. There is uh, a, a growing body of empirical evidence. We quote here two uh, strands of work. The first one is the work by Reinhard and Rogoff, in which they analyze the correlation between public debt and economic growth. They consider uh, a large panel of countries, 44 countries, and a very long time span. Given the limit, data limitation, they, they can't go uh, any further than uh, studying correlations, and they do find a negative one. Then there are studies which use panel regression analysis, and there are two examples that are quoted here. The first one is a work by IMF colleagues, Kumar and Wu, which uh, analyzed 38 uh, countries. Here the time span is shorter, it's just 38 years, and is concentrated towards the last uh, three or four decades. Then there is work by colleagues from the European Central Bank, which, con which concentrates on, on Eurara countries. And again, it, uh, it concentrates on the last uh, uh, four, uh, four decades. So what about our paper and how does it fit in, into, uh, into this literature? Our uh, paper concentrates on a single country, which is Italy. It, is, uh, it uses regression analysis. And we think Italy is an interesting uh, case to, to be studied for, uh, for one reason, because it has, uh, we do have a, a long time series for public debt, which we have reconstructed uh, in the past, and it's publicly available since uh, 2008, and what we have seen is that uh, uh, public debt in, uh, as a ratio of GDP shows sufficient variability over these 150 years, and in it, Italy experienced very high public debt also in, uh, in peacetime, and we think we can exploit this variability to extract some, uh, some information. The second difference, uh, uh, the second uh, characteristic that differentiates our paper with respect to the one I was quoting before is how we approach the problem. We uh, don't go directly to the data. We try to start from, I, I have to say, a very, very simple model. But nevertheless, we try to uh, derive our estimating equation from uh, uh, a model that has been studied in the literature, which is a standard growth model based on a standard production function. So before going to the model and then to the results, some, uh, uh, I would like to give you some brief highlights of what the data say, crude data, what the crude data have to say. First, since we are interested in the relation of, uh, between public debt and economic growth, we analyzed, uh, uh, we went and looked if, to see if in our data we, we have a negative correlation between these two variables, and indeed we have. We have a strong negative correlation. In here uh, uh, you see the, the plot of the debt to trend GDP uh, with respect to uh, real per capita income growth. And there is a negative correlation. In here we exclude the year that go uh, from the start of the First World War to the first parliamentary um, election because we, we, have, we want to avoid our results to be affected by uh, the extreme values that are recorded either because of or just after the, the World Wars. Uh, 
As I was said, there is this strong correlation. It is evident also in the two sub-periods, so before first world war, the First World War and after the second one. This correlation is stronger in the more recent period with respect to the, uh, the first one, but nevertheless it's there in both of them. When analyzing the data, we uh, f faced what we labeled a puzzle. So we see this strong negative correlation, but uh, there are two periods which attracted our attention, and those are the periods at the turns of the two century. And these are interesting periods because they share some common features which are, which are relevant in our analysis. First, they both include the two peak, local peaks of uh, debt to GDP, which by chance happened to be in 1894 and 1994, at around or just about 120% of GDP. Both these periods coincide with world expansionary cycles, both in terms of GDP and trade. And the third thing that they have in common is that there is declining growth in the periods of debt accumulation. But the interesting thing is that they differ in one very important aspect. In the first sub-period, when debt starts declining, growth starts picking up, this doesn't happen in the uh, more, re more recent period. So from 1995 to 2007, when debt starts declining, growth doesn't increase. So we wanted to, uh, um, to see if the way in which we approach the model, if our model and our results help helps us to explain this puzzle, to explain why this correlation seems to break down in the most recent uh, uh, decades. So just to go very briefly on our background model, as I said, it is a very standard one. It is based on a standard production function, which allows us to jointly consider exogenous and endogenous component in GDP growth. We start from the production function, do the usual stuff, uh, which is uh, uh, take uh, logs and per capita values, then, lo then first differences, and then assuming that our time series are uh, integrated of order one and that the first differences are I zero, we can write our uh, model in an error correction form with distributed logs. And given that Given this very simple framework, we can derive uh, an estimating equation, which is the one that you can see in the slides, which is the one that we bring to the data to see if it is supported by the empirical evidence. I would like to draw, to draw your attention to three points that we think are worth noticing and that uh, make our deep paper a bit different with respect to the one that you find in the literature. The first one is that given that we start from uh, a growth model, a production function um, specification, it is here very clear that you have to include also the capital level and you will see also the first difference, so capital accumulation. Otherwise, there is a risk of misspecification so that the coefficients are biased and that don't provide you with the correct picture of the effects that you want to trace out. The second one is that given that you write it like this, it is very clear that you cannot just use first differences, but you also have to include the, uh, variables in levels in the, in the estimation. And the third thing which we, we think it's interesting is that doing, writing the model like this allows us to draw some testable restrictions and to, among the estimated coefficients and to see if those are uh, confirmed by by the estimation. So we can see if, our, if the data fit, fit the model well. So as to the data that we use, uh, we start from a very simple specification in which uh, in the specification I said, uh, I showed before, in the function f, we just include uh, the variable that captures the debt level and we use as, uh, as a proxy the ratio between that and trend GDP, where trend GDP is, is uh, derived with a hodrick prescott filter on the GDP series. For the GDP time series, we have used the results of Buffy Getol that have been uh, uh, presented yesterday. And for the stock of capital, again, we are very thankful to, our, to all the colleagues that have uh, uh, worked for this project because we were able to use a new series for both the labor force and the capital stock. And in particular, we refer, we, here we refer to the work of Broadberry, Giordano and Zollino that again was presented yesterday. As I mentioned before, in the empirical analysis, we exclude uh, the periods between the First World War and the end of the Second World War to, to avoid having our result contaminated by the very large and extreme values that are uh, recorded during the, the World Wars. So 
let's move quickly to the results. Uh, you can see here a table that summarizes the main ones. So what we did when we uh, started our empirical analysis, we uh, checked that our time series are, were integrated of order one and that the first differences were I zero and that there was a core integrating vector so that we could actually write the model as we, as we hoped. Then we started our selection, uh, our se the specification selection process started for, with a very large number of uh, um, legs, four, and then we start, we moved from general to specific, dropping the variables that did not appear to be significant. Over doing this process, one thing it's worth mentioning is that the coefficients of the variable of interest, debt and capital, are stable and that their sign is stable and also the magnitude is stable through all this selection process. Then the diagnostic, diagnostic tests were favorable and we also used a robust standard error because we couldn't reject the hypothesis that there was uh, heteroscedisticity. So if you look at the results, the coefficient have the expected sign, so that seems to have a negative impact uh, on, on GDP growth. Also the change in debt does have a negative impact on, uh, on GDP growth, while capital and capital accumulation do boost uh, uh, economic activity. As you can also see, I, I reported here the um, the restrictions that are imposed on the coefficients from our, our theoretical model do pass the empirical test, so they are accepted by, by the data. So here, what you can also see is that the significance of the error correction term and of the lag differentiated variable gives some support of the hypothesis there is, that there is Granger causality between debt and, and GDP growth. Finally, as I mentioned before, the tests for the nonlinear restrictions are accepted. And also, when we, re when we re estimate our model using constrained um, estimation, results do not change and the direction and the magnitude of the effects are confirmed. We started, given this basic model, we started doing some robustness check and see if there was something that needed to be added in, in our very, very simple framework. The first one is that we investigated for the possibility that there, that there was a break between the two sub-periods. Indeed, there seems to be. The breaks mainly affect the value, the significance of the constant term and of the time, of the constant term and of the time trends. The direction, the, direct, the, uh, the negative effect of uh, debt on GDP growth is confirmed. In the second period, it mostly depends on the change of debt and not so much on the, on the level of, uh, of the ratio between debt and GDP. We also did some further robuster check we were aware that there might be problem of endogeneity, so we also used two stage least squares and instrumental variables, and results are confirmed. We also uh, tried to uh, estimate our model with a vector error correction model to see the impulse response functions, and again, results were confirmed in the sense that we again find a negative effect of lag debt on GDP, uh, on GDP growth. <laughs> Finally, we also did uh, uh, some robustness check in the sense that we substituted the um, debt to GDP ratio with the debt per capita or the debt per, per worker uh, values and again the direction of the effect seems to be, uh, to be confirmed. Again, given our very simple model, we started to augment our, uh, our regression to include other uh, variables that could capture other things that affect GDP growth apart from, uh, from the debt level. We have used plenty of them and we just built on the literature that has, uh, that has studied growth. In particular, we have uh, included in our analysis uh, proxies for the world growth, uh, 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 growth rate, which is proxied by the growth rate in the Western Europe and the US, a measure of openness which takes into account uh, the, um, uh, the weight of uh, import and export, a proxy for the human capital formation of government size, the old age dependency ratio. I mean, you can read all of them. We tried many. Surprisingly, none of, none of those do add much explanatory power to our model. They don't seem, and most of them are not significant or, I mean, their significance is not, not very stable. So it seems that including the debt to GDP ratio captures a lot of things. And this is because many of these variables are also 
correlated. So there are also econometrics problems when you introduce all of this variable in the, in the estimation. The other thing that we did since it was a, a, um, an issue hotly debated in the literature was the possibility of having threshold effects. And in our model, we didn't find strong evidence in, in favor of having a threshold. How we did this, we started including dummy variables at very low value of debt and then moving upwards. And those did not appear to be significant when the value of debt was above, uh, let's say, certain levels. The other thing that we started to study when we had our basic model was the, what, 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 could have, what could be the transmission channel. And the very uh, easy shot was to look for the transmission channel in the investment uh, in, the, the, in the capital accumulation process. So what we did was we regressed investment against debt and indeed we, find, we found a negative and significant coefficient. Again, we looked at the impulse response function and again it seems that high debt levels do affect the ability of the economy to uh, accumulate capital. So the transmission channel seems to be through investment and capital accumulation. So after I've, I have given you this uh, very, very quick uh, overview of our results, let's get back to the question we had when we approached uh, uh, the problem of analyzing the relation between debt and growth. And it was the puzzle that I presented to you at, at, the, at the very beginning. So what we wanted to do it was to see if our results help us explain why it seems that the correlation breaks down in the last, over the last two decades. So if we look back at at these two periods, it, there are a uh, few things that our econometric analysis suggests us we, we should check. The first one, it, it is what is happening to capital accumulation. The second one is the size and the speed of the debt reduction. And the third one is the incidence of foreign debt. I went very quickly, so I, 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 I forgot to, to tell you that among the robustness check that we did, the, uh, the variables that we included in our, in our augmented model, there is also the ratio of foreign debt uh, to GDP, foreign public debt. And in our analysis, it turns out that this is a significant explanatory variable, for the especially for the first sub period. So for the years that go from national unification to the first world war. So what we did we, it was to look at these three issues and to see how they, uh, they were uh, moving in the two sub periods that, were, that we were considering. So indeed what happens is that what happened was that the, the rate of capital accumulation was indeed increasing in 1895 to 1994 when that was declining, but it was not in 1995 or 2000. One explanation is it's possible that the economy was in different development stages here. Second thing to notice is that the decline in debt was very fast and large, sizable in the first sub-period, sub while over the last two decades the decline in debt has been quite slow, and that never really went to what we could call low level. For example, it never went below the 100% uh, threshold. The third thing is that foreign debt played an important role in the first sub period. Uh, between 1895 uh, and 1914, the decrease in foreign debt was about 23%, was about 23 percentage point of GDP. In the second sub period, basically foreign debt uh, didn't move. So it played a very different role in, in those uh, two periods, and if we take all this into consideration, we can understand why looking at raw correlation between debt and uh, the ratio of debt and GDP growth, it seemed that the model bro broke down, but in fact it did not. If you use uh, this more, let's say, uh, this framework which takes into account all these factors, you can again trace a negative effect between the level of debt and, uh, and GDP growth. Finally, in our econometrics, there is one thing that we were not able to capture, and it is the role of uh, uh, fiscal stimulus effects. And this is mainly because of a problem, uh, a problem of, well, mainly two problems. One of data in which you have to reconstruct uh, the fiscal stimulus, to you, so you have to reconstruct the flows, the deficit uh, at the different times in a proper way. And the second one is a problem of collinearity. It obviously the deficit is very correlated with the change in debt. So from an econometric point of view, it creates lots of, of problems. Anyway, we can use descriptive analysis to see if there is, a, a, let's say, a role played by, the, by, the, uh, by fiscal policy over the two sub-periods. 
So if you do that, what you can see is that in the 19th century, the fiscal consolidation started much earlier than when, start, when that started declining. So the fiscal contraction that was needed to achieve that, that reduction was of a let's say limited uh, um, magnitude. In the second sub-period sub instead, you start from, Italy started from very, very high uh, levels of the net borrowing, about 10%. So the fiscal contraction that was needed to start, what I said before, uh, anyway, slow uh, progress in the debt reduction was large. So probably the impact on the economy in this second case, in this second case was uh, much more contractionary. And you can see this here we plot in the first panel, you see in the first sub-period you don't have data for the general government, so you have to rely on that on the state sector. Anyway, if you look at the state sector, the balance, uh, sorry, yes, the, the budget was almost balanced. Uh, it, there wasn't a need to, let's say, uh, mm, to adjust public accounts very, very strongly to start the debt reduction and you could like more easily uh, follow the uh, world growth and, and the growth in trade. In the second period instead, the difference between expenditure and, and revenue was large. So the fiscal stimulus impact there was probably more significant. And you can also see it in this graph in which you can see that the red bars which measure the change in the deficit between 1894 and 1913, this is for the state budget, and in the second case 1994-2007, and this is for the general government, are very different uh, size. The order of magnitude is, is, is very different. So to summarize, I hope I haven't used too much time. No, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we did was we went to the data and see if there was some support on the proposition of a negative link between public debt and, and economic growth. Different from other studies, we, we tried to base our analysis from even a simple but at least a, a theoretical framework, a model which was a standard production function approach, focusing on a single country instead of having a panel uh, regression. Our results give some support to the proposition that there is a negative impact of very high level of debt on GDP growth and there is an important role played also by um, the foreign debt component especially for the first sub period before the first world war. As expected we do find a significant impact of capital accumulation on GDP growth but this is obviously not surprising. However there are some limitations in our analysis the first limitations or things that could like, be addressed more extensively, which is that we didn't find that other growth determinants have a strong impact on GDP growth. And here, one possibility is that the proxies that we use do not capture uh, properly the phenomenon that we want to study. Or secondly, that there are data limitations, so there is not much you can do that. The, th the second limitation is that we cannot uh, control directly in our framework uh, for the impact of fiscal policy. Even though we couldn't do that in our econometric analysis, we tried to do that complementing it with a like, more descriptive, or descriptive uh, approach. As I said, these are issues that probably we should study and analyze further, having in mind that there are two obstacles which are difficult to overcome, not impossible, we will have to work much more harder. One is that availability, so try to, for example, study better the stock flow adjustment or the flows and, and so on. And the second one is a technical problem which is of a strong multicollinearity among some of the variables which makes, in some cases, the empirical analysis more, more challenging. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> is uh, um, had back surgery and decided that it was unsafe for him to, <coughs> to travel. So he sent us a fairly long comment, uh, which uh, will be made available to those of you who are interested, but uh, uh, we decided I did, to summarize it somehow by, um, with, uh, with some uh, slides. Uh, the uh, bot, this is the, Summary of the paper as he sees it uh, that says that the authors investigate 
the two periods, 1818-1914, when there is a negative relation between debt and growth, and then the second period, where they argue that uh, the uh, negative correlation broke down. Um, he says that the paper is both historical and econometrics, and uh, the conclusion is that the results provide some support. And this is a quote from their paper. <coughs> of a negative relation between public debt and growth. Uh, the negative relation seems to be different in the two periods considered. And uh, uh, he uh, argues that uh, the paper says that econometric analysis supports the existence of the structural break around the end of the 20th century. Uh, the economic interpretation of the econometric results is that changes in the debt ratio influence the level of investment and hence the rate of growth. And uh, it is a restatement according to his uh, um, evaluation of the crowd, crowd, standard crowding out, uh, crowding out uh, effect. Uh, comments. I think the main point of Artoni's comment is that uh, uh, there is a growth debt relation that dominates the debt growth relation. This is the main contention, if I read uh, my friend Artoni correctly. Uh, that is, the economy has the dominant effect, sorry, the dominant effect over the fiscal, the fiscal variables. Um, and then uh, uh, he goes on by a long description of uh, destabilizing choices made by public finance on economic activity. There are some of them, the major wars. The early uh, 1970s are certainly, are certainly outliers in that. Uh, 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 and then the very high yield of the em em debt emissions that uh, we had in the 1980s. Uh, he believes that these choices that he acknowledges were, had a negative impact on the economy, however, they do not impact uh, really on trend growth uh, through the investment channel. So he suggests a different reading of the, of the events, and uh, here it is. Um, for the first period, uh, he breaks the period down into two sub-periods. Uh, 1887, 1894, where there is growing debt accumulation, and uh, that he, he says that during that period the economy was either in re recession or stagnant, uh, that uh, public debt increased essentially in this particular period, and uh, uh, it is, in his opinion, extremely difficult to see a nexus between the changes in debt ratio, capital accumulation, and rate of growth of the economy up to the end of the, of the uh, century. I, he quotes some uh, uh, authors of the time. He doesn't uh, give um, a more precise definition, as far as I can tell of uh, uh, his contention. I must say that uh, uh, Roberto is a very, he knows Italian economic history very well. He's a very good scholar of uh, Italian long-term public finances. Then there is 1994-1913, uh, and there he re quotes Fenoltea, where uh, he, Fenoltea has, uh, as we know, a different interpretation of what's going on. Uh, and uh, mostly Fenoltea's, Fenoltea's argument, for those of you who are not familiar, is connected with the uh, international business cycle. I mean, he explains Italian uh, economic growth until 1913, basically, by uh, the uh, international cycle of investment. Uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, so they conclusion by Artone is very simple. There was a very strong economic growth, which he explains with Fenoltea by international factors, and this is what produces the reduction in the debt to, uh, to uh, GDP ratio. So conclusion, and this is, I, uh, I, quote precisely from uh, Roberto in order to make sure that I don't uh, 
misinterpret his views. So the paper argues that the budget in the Crispi Sonnino de Rudini was growth friendly. In the period 1992 uh, 97, the composition of the budget in lire oro, that is in uh, constant prices, was the following 31% interest on public debt, 25% military expenditure, 22% public works. And uh, which were approximately 2% of GDP, 20% of the services. Pareto, Pantanelloni, and Nitti would not have considered growth friendly our budget. So here are considerations of the composition of the budget rather than the uh, uh, stock of debt. Um, um, Considerations of the previous decades would not modify the general picture. Only in the Jolitian era, until the war of, uh, on Libya in 1911, the excellent economic performance and the consequent increase in public revenues improved the quality of state intervention and therefore also contributed to growth. But this was, again, uh, uh, um, an effect of the composition, I think, of expenditure in his view than, uh, than stock of debt. Uh, then he turns to discuss uh, the uh, later period, 85 to 2007. Uh, the authors said the negative correlation between change in debt GDP seems to, be, um, to break down. There are two possible explanations, a structural break. And he says that this is what the authors think. And the causal, <coughs> excuse me, the causal interpretation of the nexus between debt and growth has to be refused, i.e., he says, changes in the ratio are largely endogenous, he argues. Uh, the composition and level of public expenditure are essentially the same in Italy and in the other European countries in the second period, and he has in the, in, the, in the written version, uh, a long uh, um, discussion of this. Uh, the economic performance until 1992 was unsatisfactory, notwithstanding the fall of 20 points, um, basic point, uh, 20 points in uh, GDP points in uh, uh, the ratio of debt to GDP. Explanations of our negative relative performance have to be found outside of the public sector. This is his main, his main strong point, that he doesn't find uh, big faults in the public sector behavior after, uh, um, until, until at least 2000. And so conclusions. Overall concluding, <coughs> excluding exceptional events, the evolution of debt to GDP ratio is largely endogenous. In other words, direct interventions on the level and composition of public expenditure and revenues finalized to the reduction of the ratio of public debt to GDP either have perverse effects in periods of recessions or cannot compensate the negative effect of the deterioration of fundamental structural factors such as the competitiveness of the private sector and the distribution of income. This is the message I convey to the audience <laughs> from uh, our friend uh, Roberto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gianni. Any comment, uh, question? When Italy joined the euro area, yes. there was a significant free ride on the interest rate you paid on your public debt. Mm -hmm. And that free ride seems to end now. But for 20 years, you have, paid a, you have paid an interest on your public debt as if you had half of the public debt that you had, sort of in, 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 in terms, currency terms. So for 20 years, you have a, uh, it must have some effect of your analysis of the last period. Thank you. Two things. One is related, and it's, it's possible to compute the debt service rather than use the debt stock as a reason why it does or does not grow. And the other important thing would be, and you try but say you don't find much, to understand what is the channel that goes from high debt through low growth, presumably through changes in policy variables. And one specific thing that I don't know whether you tried is you use the labor force, but what about unemployment and hours per worker that in some recent work look very related to taxation, which in turn uh, is very related to the debt position of the country. So the question is whether you tried. So starting for the from the last ones, uh, 
we didn't try our work or unemployment or some other variables because we don't, didn't have a reliable very long time series for that. We have been, say, drawing extensively from the time series that have been built uh, for this research project, which was very large and very rich, but it didn't have everything. So in, in a supplement, when more, more of this information is obviously released or reconstructed, we will use that. To the, as to the other question, debt services, the impact of interest, and so on. Uh, Again, this is related to the problem of uh, having very long and consistent time series for budget items. So we don't have a time series for interest expenditure for the general government sector for this long time period. So we couldn't directly do that. What we, what we did find uh, where data were available, we had data on uh, interest rates on debt on certain types of medium and long-term bonds issued by uh, the Italian government for all this period. So what we did and we included in the analysis was the differentials between the level of these interest rates and the level of some reference countries, which were the US, the UK and Germany for two reasons. One, because these are the countries for which you have long time series. So you have the data for those interest rates also in the 19th century. And second one, because they are the natural terms of reference, so UK in the 19th century, then the US, and then Germany for the most recent years. So what, what we did in one of our augmented models was to include this differential among the explanatory variable and it doesn't add that much. One of the problem for the issue that you were raising about joining the, U, the Euro area is that, well, we have a too short time span in our 150 years analysis because it's just the last few years. And anyhow, we stop our, our analysis in 2007 to avoid the extreme values recorded because of the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 affected some of the results. So I don't know if it will be very easy to, uh, to overcome this, this problem in the very short, uh, short run because they mostly relate to data issues. So we, we can try to see if there are better proxies and, and try to do our best. Then instead coming to the uh, issues raised by, um, by, Harvard, by our discussion, there are, there are two things which I would like to, uh, to to say. The first one is that uh, I don't know if we weren't too clear in the paper or maybe I wasn't clear in the presentation. I don't know. Probably I'll try to do my best now. We do not claim that there is a structural break at the turn of the 20th century between the end of the last century and the beginning of this decade. What we say is that we do find a a break between the two large sub periods, which is before World War I and after the Second World War. What we say is that, that if you look at the raw data, the raw correlation between debt to GDP ratio and growth rates appears to break down. And this is a fact. The second thing we say is that, yes, it appears that the correlation breaks down, but if you use a little so if you go beyond the, beyond the pure correlation, you use a model in which you consider capital accumulation, in which you consider what the literature on growth has, has taught us, then the correlation is there. If you control for these other factors and then you run the estimation, you again find a negative link between the debt level and, and, and the growth rate. So this is basically what we say when we say we have a puzzle. We try to address it. We bring our model to the data and see if it works, and the model suggests us some of, of some explanations, some other issues that you, you should control for, not just the pure correlation. And indeed, in the sub-periods that, that were mentioned, for example, when there is this claim that there is the uh, international business cycle that drives the Italian economy and allows the, the debt to GDP ratio to be reduced without harmful, harmful effect on growth, is precisely what we, we think we also capture in the analysis because this is a captured by the capital accumulation process that we control for. So what we say is that yes, if you look at the pure correlation, the model seems to well, the correlation doesn't work very well in some sub-periods. If you work with, it is not a sophisticated model. It's very standard and very simple approach that we know from like three decades. So 
we, we don't claim we, we build something very new on, on the theoretical grounds. As to the problem and the issue of, uh, uh, of causality, yes, there's the chicken, the egg, and, and the old story. We don't think we have put the final word on, on this issue. But again, in the way we address the problem, we think we can at least try to test. And it seems there is support for Granger causality, which is not a definitive answer, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's there. And then, obviously, as it was said before, probably you should look one of the claims that was in, were in the discussion in the discussion comments, you should also look outside the public sector and see if there are other things that affect the results. Yes, that's true, and this is actually what we do given the model we use, because controlling for the capital accumulation, you also take into uh, account, uh, uh, into account uh, these, these factors. Probably not in, in a perfect way, some, maybe in a loose way, but that's the best we, uh, we could do. Just a quick word on one point also raised by the discussant, which is the issue of whether the budget was uh, growth friendly in the early decades of the uh, Italian uh, unified history. Um, what we meant by that is that we looked at the composition of the state budget and uh, we noted that um, if you take the expenditure for public investment over that period and you accumulate it, it accounts more or less for 80% of debt accumulation over the same period. So essentially, the budget over at, at that time was operating, uh, perhaps unconsciously, according to what we now call the golden rule. This is not true in the second period. Uh, most of the debt accumulation after the Second World War is not uh, due to public investment, but to current expenditure. Thank you. I was wondering whether the different effects in the two sub-periods in terms of impact of debt on growth uh, could be also linked to the different level of uh, um, tax pressure. I mean, in, in the 1890s, 1913 period, the tax level was something around 15% of GDP. If we look at the last 15 years, it's been something like 40% of GDP. That must certainly have an impact on how much the level of public debt conditions the whole economic life of the country and the possibilities of, of uh, uh, growth. Uh, on a separate point, uh, I think that we have indeed uh, for the post-war period um, a pattern of uh, economic growth conditioning very much the level of GDP. In most industrialized countries, that to GDP either declined or remained stable until the beginning of the 1970s, then started growing slowly, much faster in Italy in the 1980s, but then also elsewhere. So we have more or less everywhere in the G7 countries a strong decline of economic growth uh, starting from the 1970s, having an impact on public uh, finances in Italy already in the 1970s, elsewhere a bit later, but you do have a common pattern in G7 developed countries, growing debt, creeping uh, or through uh, sudden jumps uh, in, in periods of higher crisis, but more or less everywhere you have a decline of growth and an increase in debt. But if you look at the sequence, in part it looks like uh, it's driven more by the decline of growth, but at the end, uh, there are periods in which you see that a uh, high level of debt is a major constraint on economic policies and also on the uh, spending power of uh, consumers. I mean, it's very clear at the moment in, uh, in countries which are forced to reduce budget deficit uh, that the high level of debt uh, forces to cut investment, public investment, private investment, uh, consumption but it is not the same in all periods. Thank you. Um, I was trying to put on a slide to answer your first question about uh, the, tax the tax burden and um, basically I think it was most on having, having to do with the magnitude of the government sector so when you say it's about 15, yes, it's, it's most it was 18% of GDP if you look at uh, the revenue from taxation in the state, uh, in the state budget over before World War I. So basically what you have, you have, it's true, two different worlds. One in which 
size of the government is smaller and the other one in which it's, uh, it's larger. And we actually, let's say, uh, comment on this in our descriptive analysis in, in the paper here. You can see in, in this chart also another thing. When, you, when there was the adjustment in the first period, it came from a reduction in spending and a reduction in revenues a little bit uh, smaller if you look at the change in the primary expenditure, but because there the adjustment uh, that was required was very small because they were already close to the ba balance in the budget. But again, when that started declining, it's true also the revenue decreased. In the second period, you have this large fiscal uh, input negative one because you reduce the, the net borrowing uh, very much. But how do you do that? Well, you cut expenditure, mostly interests, <laughs> because you, have the, you had this dividend, especially in the last part. I mean, this doesn't capture everything, but I mean, it's there. And, sorry? Yeah, what a period, well chosen. <laughs> and, and also increases in revenues. So here the tax burden, it, it's not very friendly for sure. Yeah, um, I think the two papers we refer to in the introduction of our study, the, the one by the uh, IMF and the other one by the ECB, they cover precisely the period you are referring to, the last 40 years roughly, roughly and they, they, they work uh, on a cross-section of countries. And, you know, they, their results um, show that when you control for other factors, there you still see... Uh, a negative impact of the debt to GDP ratio onto growth. So, yeah, point taken. 